Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. It's lovely to see you all. My name is Allison. I'm the Chief Engagement Officer here at KDHX. And uh, this is the last in this series of conversations about race in the blues in St. Louis that we're doing in partnership with the St. Louis Blues Society. So I want to thank Jeremy Siegel Moss and Alonzo Townsend and everybody there at the uh, St. Louis Blues Society for going on this journey with us. Uh, KDHX is a nonprofit community radio station. We hold our first pledge drive of 2018 starting tomorrow. So if y'all don't know what we're about, that's a good time to tune in and learn about it and show your support. If conversations like this are important to you, then please support it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to bring Jeremy up here and he's going to introduce our moderator and our panel, and um, yeah, just thanks again for being here. We all really appreciate it. Hi, um, I'm Jeremy from the St. Louis Blues Society, and um, I'd like to really thank KDHX for partnering with us to make this all happen. It's been a really fun journey, and um, also, we don't always get to thank them, but thanks to all of the audio people back there, um, Josh and Andy. Um, if you've been at home and you've watched it live stream, that does take a little bit of work, and that's what all these cameras are here for, so beware that you're on camera and the whole world is watching. Uh, the St. Louis Blues Society is a non-for-profit organization. It's been around for over 30 years, and uh, we are membership-based, so if you'd like to become a member and receive one of our compilation CDs or find out what we're doing, uh, we have all that information outside. And I will double down um, membership drive for Katie Jack starts momentarily, so please make sure that you give generously. Um, we've had uh, a great couple conversations so far, and Dr. Raz has been our moderator and has been amazing. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Raz, who's an educator, an activist, and superb human being right here, Dr. Raz. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for being here uh, today for our third and last conversation, which is the future evolution of the blues. And to really uh, get us started, I usually, and I'm going to sit down for a moment, I uh, usually like to go through the order of the program as to what to expect uh, in the way of getting you all engaged as audience participants. And to do that, let me just quickly point out a couple of things. I will, first of all, enlist volunteers from you all, the audience, okay, uh, to read aloud. We have two quotes uh, today, as well as we have four key terms. So I'll be coming to you all right away to do that. After we go through the two quotes and the four key terms, then I will introduce our very distinguished panel of guests. And uh, from there, we'll go ahead and start the conversation, first among the panelists, and then we'll open it up to you as audience participants to raise the questions that you would like to interact with the panelists regarding. And lastly, uh, as we wrap up toward the last 15 minutes of today's program, I usually like to try to find a way to, again, involve you as the audience in a closing, especially today, a closing activity. So we'll talk about that when we get closer to that part of the program. So let's go ahead and get started with those who are there in our sound booth, uh, our audio tech, you all are ready, and our person is handling the video. Let's go uh, with the first slide. And if I can please get a volunteer from the audience. Okay, I have a hand down here, Jeremy. Oh, stranger. Okay. Thank you. Do I need to introduce myself? Yes, go ahead. All right, my name is Terry Harden and I'm from the National Blues Museum. Very important to begin with art in talking about race. Cornell West. All right, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Of course, for those of you who may not know him and for those of you who do, uh, Cornell West is a philosopher, an author, uh, social commentator and also an educator at Princeton University. He's probably best known for his book entitled Race Matters, okay? Let's go to the next quote, please. Now may I have another volunteer and I see a hand back there, thank you. My name is Tina Miner and I have a membership with the National Blues Museum. 
The blues, the blues are the true facts of life, expressed in words and song, inspiration, feeling, and understanding. Willie Dixon. Of course, Willie Dixon is known, uh, has been known as a Chicago blues artist, producer, songwriter who wrote or co-wrote more than 500 songs which were recorded by some of the best known blues musicians of his era and have since also been recorded by a lot of today's pop artists. So thank you all for at least getting us started with those very important quotes because those quotes help to put us in a frame of mind as to what you know we're going to be talking about today. Now let's bring up the first of four terms, key terms that will pertain to our conversation. If I can please have a volunteer to read this term for us. I see a hand, okay. Yeah, Charles Johnston. Uh, blues, a song often of lamp often of lamentation, characterized by usually 12-bar phrases, three-line stanzas in which the words of the second line usually repeat those of the first, and continual occurrence of blue notes in melody and harmony in jazz or popular music using harmonic and phrase structures of blues. All right, well, thank you. Let's go with the second term. Someone please volunteer for that one. Okay. I see a hand. Okay, thank you. Innovation, the introduction of something new, a new idea, method, or device. All right. <laughs> That's right. Okay, we got a very distinguished voice in the house. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next one. Someone please volunteer for that one. Uh, we have a hand up in the corner. All right. Yeah, my name is Rich Reese. All right. Key term, technology. A capability given by the practical application of knowledge a manner of accomplishing a task, especially using processes, methods, or knowledge, new technologies for information storage. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for getting us started. It's a way of immediately getting you as audience particip participants in this process. So as a recap of our last conversation, uh, which was the second conversation that took place two Sundays ago here at KDHX. And uh, just quickly, as a part of this recap of that uh, topic, which was the present reality of blues music today. And of course, we had some very distinguished panelists then, uh, Eugene Dobbs Bradford. We had um, John May and, of course, Dion Brown. And I want to just quickly capture six major points from that conversation. The first one dealt with unresolved issues of how race and class influence the perception and value of blues music as the actual basis of all American music. The second point, to this date, there continues to be a lack of competitive compensation for blues musicians compared to musicians of other genres. The third point that was made is that blues musicians need to have people, that means all of you as well as those online tuning in through Facebook Live, uh, we need to have champions cheerleaders, people who appreciate and place a high value on blues music and as artists, as contributors to the culture and history of this nation. The fourth point made is in regards to our cultural contributions in that if we continue to allow anyone to belittle and attempt to not acknowledge a group of people other than those of the dominant culture, then it becomes easy for that heritage and that culture to be 
disrespected and eventually even destroyed or eliminated. And that brings me to the fact that just over the weekend, I was watching All Eyes on Me, a film released in 2017. And in that film, it talks about Tupac Shakur. Some, how many heard of the hip-hop artist Tupac Shakur? Anyway, Tupac in this uh, film is a very short but poignant uh, quote, I thought, that's relevant to what we're talking about today. And that is that he said, the only thing that we can leave behind is our culture and our music. Again, let me repeat that. The only thing that we can leave behind is our culture and our music. The fifth point from that discussion two weeks ago, and that is this, there must be a foundation or a starting point. In the case of blues music, enslaved black people originated this music before other racial and cultural groups could add their musical instruments and styles to it. Blues music was considered the folk music of black people, the originators of this American art form. And in short, we're talking about a foundation, okay? So when we think about a foundation, we need that in order to build upon. But if we disrespect or do not give credit to the foundation, then what are you building upon? So in essence, we go back to the fact that a foundation is needed before anything can be added to it, which gets to the article that was uh, written back in 2016, which would be referred to today perhaps as part of our conversation. And the article dealt with white, you know, white people, the blues, and cultural appropriation. And when we think about the foundation for a culture and a music that was founded by enslaved, oppressed black people, that's the foundation. So how can you deny the foundation and start to give credit to all the other artists that added to it without recognizing the it being the foundation? So again, I want to uh, reemphasize that we have been touching up on that whole point about the importance of understanding that blues music is the foundation, which was laid first by an oppressed, enslaved black people, then later others built up on it, even if they didn't give credit to the foundation. They had to first know that there was a foundation. And lastly, there is a quote by a distinguished American author Russell Banks. He also happens to be white, and he was quoted by Cornell West. And this particular quote uh, from Russell Banks, he said that blues music is probably the only true history of America. In terms of being willing to confront the kind of things that Melville, Twain, and Faulkner wrote about and was pushing us toward in their own ways, the so-called white side of the culture, but it's the blues laying it out on the black side of culture. And he goes on to say, but both ultimately recognizing that our destinies are intertwined. I think that's the found, fundamental lesson that we all have to learn. So given that, let's go ahead and get ready to get started and to address what I like to refer to as the business of culture, because that's the money side of culture too, and, and as how do we move forward from here. So let me start with our panelists. The first of our panelists is Alonzo Townsend. Alonzo Townsend is the son of the legendary Grammy Award-winning Delta Blues man, Henry James Townsend. He's also a blues and hip-hop producer and blues historian, board member of the St. Louis Blues Society, the entertainment director at the National Blues Museum, and also the co-CEO of Knox Entertainment LLC and Re record label. So again, All right. <laughs> Going in alphabetical order by first name, the next person up is Dylan Triplett. All right. <laughs> Dylan.
Dylan Triplett is only 17 years old, y'all. Yeah. Okay. And he's an up and coming blues musician here in, from the East St. Louis, St. Louis area. So let's give it up again. Thank you for having Dylan. me. And now the next person is Marquise Knox. Yeah. Uh, That's right. Happy birthday, Marquise. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Okay, and of course, Marquise Knox is not only a, a, a band leader, but he's a blues music prodigy and the co-CEO of Knox Entertainment, LLC, and record label. And last but not least, and you know, I had trouble with this name and I had to ask her when she came in. I said, honey, I've heard your name pronounced two different ways, so what is the actual pronunciation of your name? And she says, Tisha Easby. So Tisha, come on up. Okay, she said it's Tisa. Okay, okay, Dan. Thank you. I don't mind being corrected because, honey, you know, I'm still learning, too. So anyway, thank you we welcome much. you. And she is the vocalist for the Tori Casey and the Southside Hustle Band. All right. OK, just so that we can get you all as panelists to start the conversation first among yourselves before we get the interaction going with our audience as participants. These are some of the questions I want you all to think about as you are beginning this conversation, okay? The first question is, how can the blues be an art form for change? The other one is, how can the genre evolve and preserve its origins? The third one is, what can we do and we meaning collectively, all of us, not just in this room, but online and everywhere else we possibly can get the word to. And that is, what can we do to create a stronger cultural identity for St. Louis through blues music? And of course, the fourth one is, how can technology, especially given today's technology, how can it influence in innovation for a blues artist? And then we'll probably look at, at the role that um, perceived cultural and monetary value for blues music, how does that affect blues musicians as well as the performance of their music, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. I see you all, you know, bobbing your head and, you know, look like you're anxious to jump right in. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And I see Marquise, you're already ready at the mic, okay? <laughs> Well, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started then. You know, you're a blues musician, okay? So where do you see this going from here, okay? And uh, again, uh, looking at some of the questions that I've already posed to you all as panelists, uh, just think about culturally, you know, how do we still respect, you know, the culture of blues music at the same time, look at how do we help blues musicians to be compensated properly for their contribution? Well, I think if it's about where the blues is going, uh, that could be tricky because we're dealing with uh, societal issues and we have to talk about the real condition of black people and until we talk about the real condition of black people, you got to give us not just paying homage, but our story has to be talked about in light of oppression, dealing with human rights violation, you know what I'm saying? So it's just not like we just come here and we need a place to stay. You know, we come here and we help build America. Cotton was king. So if we're talking about where the blues is going, I would, uh, it may be, I think it's becoming more whitewashed because I read an article, I'm not gonna call out the artist's name. One breath, Rolling Stone said, well, the new top 10 country artists. And then the Blues World wrote the upcoming blues singer, blues musician. Well, it can't be both. You can't be country and be the blues. See, that's when the appropriation come in because on the Friday night, Saturday night, was well, good to come play in the club, they come play in the club. 
Tuesday and Thursday, a Tuesday and Wednesday, they go play in the performance art theater, uh, playing country music. So we have to really talk about what is the blues before we even talk about where it can go. <laughs> That's about how I feel. Well, um, I, I I literally used that word a couple of weeks ago when we was talking about that. I used the word whitewash. Um, you have to make sure that you keep in mind, you keep mindful of exactly what the roots is. I I always talk about if you're gonna stand under the tree, you got to make sure you either gonna water it and nurture it, or if you're just gonna stand there and not nurture it, then what are you doing? You're killing the roots. So you have to make sure that you're willing to, like brother said, you have to make sure that you're willing to understand fully what the roots are. And then once you understand what those roots are, you have to pick and choose what you're ready to do. Are you ready to nurture those roots and be a part of what we're, what our culture, what our roots are, or are you just going to stand there on top of them? Um, the the one thing that that has to be understood is that no one's telling you what you can and can't play. But if you're going to label yourself as a part of the blues, or if you're going to label yourself a blues musician, you have to make sure you understand exactly what you label yourself as. Because it's one thing to be a musician and do what you love, and it's a whole other thing to be a bluesman and play the blues. Because that is not only an art form, but it's, it's, it's our way of life. It's our, it's our history. It's our heritage. And, of course, Dylan, I'm putting you on the spot as the youngster here on the stage because I saw your head going in agreement when Alonzo was talking. I'm, I'm kind of probably going to bounce off of what Alonzo and Marquis said because I, I really do agree with what they said. And, like, I feel like that you should be able to really understand fully about what's going on in the blues before you actually take that next level. If you don't appreciate it for what it is, you can't take it anywhere. So you have to actually be passionate about it. You actually have to feel what you're singing, feel what you're saying. You can't just say, oh, I don't want a soul hanging around my house. You have to have to feel that stuff. It's like, it's, it's a lot different when you're singing and it's a lot different when you're actually feeling the music and, and taking it to heart, you know? I mean, like you can see a change is gonna come all day, but if you don't, sing it and feel it and mean what it says, you really can't take it anywhere. I mean, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change anything, so. Right. And you? Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, I really think that as, I'm a parent and I'm sure these guys are, I hope you're not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this young man right here, I really, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, because we, we have to, do more with our children. We have to build our foundation from our children. My children are really young, well, not that young, but um, they love music, and I was the same way. My family would throw parties at, you know, for different people on the block in the neighborhood. It would be house parties. It would be kid-friendly parties, and guess who was always in the middle? Yeah. Me, dancing and singing my heart, my heart away. But my thing is I think we need to do more in these schools. Um, if we're gonna talk about the future, mm -hmm. We need to do more in these schools. I mean, I went to Normandy High School. Um, I didn't get much of a blues lesson or a music lesson or even a scholarship to go to college, but I kept going with music because that was the only thing I loved to do besides sports and you know, trying to become an adult in this world. But for all of us who are parents, I think we need to instill better in our children um, because they are our future. Like this young man here, he's our future. Mm -hmm. That young man there, he's our future. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're by my age. <laughs> but it's okay but still we need to instill in our future we need to instill in our kids and your daughter plays yeah Kalia plays piano see yeah. that's what I'm talking about you know I just saying you know that's what mom told me to keep doing so that's what I kept doing mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we all need to take more time with our children um, and take more time to go to their schools um, I was invited to a elementary school yeah. um, and I'm not sure what I think that elementary school is in South County um I can't remember because it's like in April, so it's kind of far away. But I was invited to do Motown night with these kids. I have no idea where the school is. <laughs> I don't know where the neighborhood is. Um, but the young lady who invited me, she's a, a white girl, and she's like, she's about maybe 20-something years old. 
and she's a teacher, and she's very smart and very intelligent. And I was like, well, why would you ask me? And she's like, well, I just love your voice, and I think that you can bring something to our Motown night. And I was, I was honored, thrilled. And I feel like that's another way of me giving back to our young people, no matter what color they are, no matter what race they are. Music is life. Music is how we express our feelings, our thoughts. And the more positive thoughts we have, the better our lives will be, you know. Negative thoughts, they go away quick, mm-hmm. you know. That's my thing of it. All right. Okay. Marquise, did you want to add something? Because it seemed like I saw. Well, I think, I think we touched on it all. It was, I think we have to really go back to it. It's a saying that they use against us sometime in the blues. They say there's no black, no white, it's just the blues. Well, it is a difference. I mean, we really have to talk about why we had the blues. You have to understand, um, in my family history, my grandmother was born in 1932, Grenada County, Mississippi, started picking cotton when she was five years old. Her mother was born and her father was born in 1904, same county. Their parents were born 1865, same county. My great-great-grandmother, father, was born into slavery, New Orleans. My great-great-grandfather, uh, mother, comes from North Carolina. So when you start talking about what the blues are, that's the blue. Most folks just think, oh, we just were dropped off here and, and we had a life. We really had to build something. How many black people ran off the land? That's the blues. When we talk about trying to build a future, we got to think about all the things we were robbed of. And then everybody say, well, do better for self. No, we have to talk about what we were robbed of, why we had the blues, and who's going to pay us back ultimately. Because, you know, we really, if we're going to be serious about the future of the blues, there had to be some form of reparation. I'm not saying, like, give me a check so I can go buy a Cadillac in most folks' eyes, but no, give my kids something that they can have an education. The same way, think about it as the GI Bill, how a lot of soldiers, white soldiers, able to come back home, get a house, able to have a mortgage, and then over the next 20 or 30 years, build up equity in their home, send their kids to college. The same black men come back home, could not get those loans, and those that did get a house, when the stock market crashed in 2008, it took all the equity and wealth out of the black community, and it has not been replaced. What we see money has been replaced in other parts of America. That's the blues. Amen. Let's keep flowing with this, you know, so let's get some reaction from the rest of you all, and then I'll go open it up to our audience participants. I mean, um, we're not we're not gonna hold any punches back. So I mean, Please that's speak the truth to yeah. We're not gonna hold any punches back, and you know that's that's exactly what it is. Um, it's not about. And another thing, I want to make sure that everyone understands. It's not about beating beating a drum about and creating a divide. It's about asking, what are you going to do? Are you willing to invest in us? Are you willing to invest in one of your greatest treasures that this country has? Our heritage is one of the greatest treasures that this country has, but no one is willing to really stand up and invest for it. This city doesn't invest for it. None of our city leaders know how tr- how much this city, it's gold coming out of the streets, and that's music. This city was built on music. I mean, the Cardinals are nice. You know, all that stuff is awesome. But this city, this city, it's the blood of Oliver Sane and Henry Townsend and Benny Smith and Tiny Bankhead. Their blood are in these streets. So if St. Louis, number one, if St. Louis would stand up and recognize that, that would help us continue to rise as one of the epicenters of this country. But right now, we're putting our stock in some of the wrong things and not saying that we don't need to build up our infrastructure. That's cool. But make sure you go down into the urban neighborhoods and build up that infrastructure, too. It's a reason why 
the first thing I, when I bring that argument up, someone say, oh, well, they're not going to do anything but tear it up. But see, here's the thing. If you, if you change the environment, if you invest in the environment, if you show that you care in the environment, a lot of those variables can be removed from our future and from those same urban communities. Mm -hmm. If you want to stop putting liquor stores in air, if you don't want to stop, put, keep putting liquor stores on each corner and a payday loan store on each corner, but I can go out there 55 and have a Costco. We can build a Costco in North St. Louis. Right. We can build a Walmart in West St. Louis. I was, I th me and bro was talking a couple of weeks ago. Wellston, that Wellston strip, mm -hmm. in the 30s and 40s, it was the most. Decent. <laughs> I right there, so yeah. It was right one of the most richest parts of town. Yeah. All the malls, department stores was in Wellston, right there in front of the bus loop. Look at it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at it now. You can put those same, the same cost it costs to put a, a ball of concrete to block off a street or to put a pretty <laughs> fence over the overpass. And I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds funny, but I'm being serious. If the same money that it costs to put a pretty fence over that overpass, can, you can put that same money in revitalizing that strip. Putting police down there, that's not beating up any, we need the police to invest well, in me, those, let say. Me, let me buy it for a dollar. You know, let, exactly, <laughs> let me buy exactly. It, you know, let me get it for a dollar, two dollars, like land, do the The land is there, the land is there, but no one cares about those communities. We're, like, we're an afterthought. Why do they not care? I'm gonna let that, I'm gonna let you guys answer that question. I'm gonna let you put up your own answer to that but why do they not care because it's so much land if you guys don't know about that Wilson strip go home and google it research it that strip was the epicenter and look at it now mm -hmm. look at it now why is it like it's that all around there. It's, just, it's, 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 it's a, it's a pit from there, so. yeah I, I'm sure no one would want to drive through there no one Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I grew uh, up five minutes yeah. away from there, so I know exactly what he's talking about. I grew up right off, uh, right across, uh, right on the other side of Wilson, actually, right down the street from Wilson High School, which was known as Halter High, I think it was. But that is now tore down. I used to look up my street and see Wilson High School, and I went to Normandy, so I used to have to catch the Metrolink, and I would come up that hill, and it always be fighting. I mean, even shootings, like right up the street from my house, some little girl passed out in front of my. Uh, in my yard one day. But how this is what I mean about education. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, why they did they tear down that school, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, they, I don't even know where these kids went, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm sure they were bused here and bused there, but I don't know if that helped that community. You know okay. what I mean? But let's look at then as artists, as, as blues musicians, then what you're beginning to talk about is how can um, music, and especially blues music, serve as a social change agent well, in a sense. Yeah. How can we well, look at that? Because it's an art form that apparently was born out of a lot of pain and suffering and oppression, but that could same pain, suffering, and oppression continues today. So, as art, you know, as artists, as musicians, then are you also advocating for musicians as artists to become social change agents? Well, yes, I think um, I, I do want to take credit for bringing in St. Louis. When I looked around, I said, okay. I said, everybody's drinking, we smoking, but nobody's talking about the history of the people. And then I start posting posts on Facebook. I start getting a lot of backlash. People were telling me, oh, Marquise, you are racist, you, you hateful, this and that and the third. I said, I said, but wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You were my friend when you were trying to give me cocaine the other night. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you were my friend when you wanted to buy me that one more shot when I told you I was full, but then when I started speaking of the truth, then it becomes a problem. We really have to talk, I, you know, not just talk about it, but I think that's one way I think this conversation come about because I don't think a lot of musicians are ready to have that conversation. I can't tell you how many people 
in my inbox different musicians in this town telling me how they felt. I never come out personally, attack them, but they always want to tell me, well, this is America, Marquis. I can say what I want to say. Well, I said, well, that's what I was trying to tell you, <laughs> what was on my mind. Then we got sent a, that article you was talking mm -hmm. about. Was this the same article? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I read the article. And then right from the jump, I knew that God didn't know nothing about black folks. When he said Barack Obama could not deny his black side because he was half white. But well, wait a minute. Do you know who Barack Obama is? He's half white, half African. He gets more of his, he probably more blacker from his mama. <laughs> Then he is his daddy in the sense of being an American black man. You just can't come here from Africa 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years, and then all of a sudden assimilate into the culture of America. And then when you look at the pundits on TV, if you really do the background search of these people, a lot of these folks who are telling black folks what to do are first and second generation African American. Y'all ain't been here since we've been here, since the conception of this nation. You haven't had to deal with the brutalization of our woman being raped, families being torn apart, but then folks want to come over here and say, well, wait a minute, this is what y'all need to do. No. Africa got all its wealth, like they just did this movie Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Africa got all its wealth. That is no, we can't go over there and claim nothing, not one piece of oil, nothing. But then everybody come over here and they assimilate and then they tell us how they have something in America. How can you keep on having people come to America if you don't want to take care of the priority minority? And that's black folks. Priority minority, y'all. Think about the legislation. We're going to have a real conversation. Think about the legislation of last year. It was really consumed on what? A little bit of health insurance. They got this tax pass last minute, but most of it was like DACA. What are we gonna do about these people? We know they in this country. We know sooner or later they will do something, but what are y'all gonna do about the inner city? Because if you're gonna allow these folks to stay, they have to stay somewhere ultimately inside the nation. So you look at places like Los Angeles, Compton used to be black. Not a Latino community. We get ran out of places we used to live in and they think we killing each other. Nobody talking about how they killing us. And these are in places where you got heavy Latino population. Then you got to deal with police brutality. Then you got to do, what Dr. Raj, you mentioned it earlier, the red line. And do, do we understand that all this stuff down from here almost to uh, Lucas and Hunt? This is old infrastructure. It was old when them folks left in the early 1900. Old infrastructure. Then you're going to ask black folks, uh, build it up. when you, The folks didn't even want to take care of themselves. They didn't even want to be associated, so you're going to make St. Louis County. Then the article come out this week. Well, last week, talking about how we could not get loans for the North City or this black area, that's another reason why the houses and the stuff is in bad shape. Well, if we can't own it, you can't get a loan to fix it, all you do is patch and try to live. And that's all we've been doing in this nation is patching ourselves and trying to live. But Dr. Reverend, uh, Reverend Barber said we are in the second reconstruction. So it's up to you all to decide with your vote how you feel about your black brothers and sisters. Just don't tell us. Go out there and put people in uh, office that talk about things like uh, Medicare for all. That just don't help black people. I live in Bowling Green, Missouri. Most of them folks, they're white and poor. They need help. That's the blues. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like me being in high school, me being a child, I, I know that like in our test books, they teach us about black history in one, probably one or two chapters in an, in an entire book. And then they tell us that we, yeah, in one month, in, in one month. I mean, and then, and then they try to 
they try to sugarcoat it by saying that we that we did music, but they don't really try to go in depth with the music. If they give us something to look forward to, maybe we can actually invest in it and actually do something with it. That's what I mean. You know what I mean? So like me being a blues singer and I, I do choral music at the same time. It's it's hard because because like sometimes I want to get like a solo in a song or something, and my teacher's like, oh well, I'm, my voice is like she's like, can you quiet it down a little bit? And I'm like, yeah, my voice is loud because I mean like I I have a reason to sing. Most people are just up there just singing for no reason, you know. I have an actual reason, I have an actual purpose to actually do what I want to do, you know. So if you give us something to look forward to, as children, we probably won't take it for granted. Most people that don't have money when they're younger and they get money, they actually cherish it a lot more than people that grew up with money around them in their faces because they know what it's like to not have it. So once you have it in your hands, you want to cherish it as much as you can because you know the worth. It's not about the amount of money, it's about the worth. It's about how much, how much you take it and, and, and as a person, you know? So like, I mean, I feel like like they were talking about, like with the cities and stuff, if you actually take it and you put some in, some kind of investment in it, it doesn't have to be a lot, just put some kind of investment in it and you show that you actually care, maybe the people will actually care about the fact that you're trying to put a little bit in there. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's my... And, and, and just to touch on what little brother is talking about, that's what I was saying earlier and I... You know, not to keep stretching it out, but that's what we have to do. You were talking about how can we invest in the future? How can we create change? Like bro said, we have to, first and foremost, we have to keep ourselves informed. The, the blessing right now of the environment is that we do have a lot of young, black, and young, in general, leaders willing to stand up and willing to take office, willing to run for these things. So we're making strides, but at the same time, you guys got to be informed too and, and understand what strides they're trying to make and get behind them, get behind them. We have to start investing in these neighborhoods. We have to show that it is a different environment. Like Dylan said, if you can show that the, if you can give these kids, if you can show these kids so many different variables, if you can change how they go outside every day, if you can change from what their eyesight see when they walk out the front porch to the bus stop, they see a liquor store on this corner, they see Joe Blow over there dealing this, if you can change those variables and give us something to appreciate and also create a relationship, ain't, ain't nobody saying run away from the police either. We have to make those things clear too, because a lot of people say when we talk about police relations in our communities and our urban communities, that it's a disconnect. It's not a disconnect. You don't have to give out candy, Chief, and I love the Chief, but you don't have to give out candy to our kids to create a relationship. All you gotta do is stand up there and talk to them. Stand on the bus, stand on the bus stop with them. Talk to them. Make, let them understand that you have a humane heart that beats just like they do. You don't have to lead them to be a police officer. Talk to them, though. Ask them what they want to be. So then when you see them tomorrow on your shift standing at the bus stop, you can ask them a little bit more, hey, have you learned about what you were telling me you are trying to do? Anything. But it, it, it's simple. But it don't include candy. Yeah. It includes <laughs> talking to our kids. Showing them that you care. Those relationships mean everything to police relations in the urban community, first and foremost. Second thing is when you do those things, you give these kids a whole nother side of life because you don't know, let me tell you something right now, you don't know what these kids go home to at the end of the night, you don't know what they eat at the end of the night, sometimes nothing, sometimes they make themselves hot pockets. Honest to God, sometimes they don't have anyone asking them how was your day at school, doing homework with them. Do those things. Ask them how are they feeling. It doesn't mean that you're infringing on whatever their home life is, but you could change their home life. You could change their, their whole life by asking them, how are you doing today? You doing all right? Did you eat last night? Those things are how you invest in the future. Then you turn around and start exposing them to what we do. Expose them to the blues. Expose them to the heritage. Expose them to an instrument. Everyone want to know why? Well, I think they want to be rappers. No, that's because they stopped teaching how important an instrument was to yeah. our children. They go all about what they see. Mm -hmm. 
They stopped teaching them. Hazelwood School District a couple of years ago cut the music budget, almost took music out of the curriculum, completely out. Why? Because music is a powerful force that can take you wherever you want to go and you never have to clock in and out. If you lose your job, you can go to the, on the corner. You ain't even got to get a gig. You can play at the Metrolink and you open your case up and if you're good, you're going to make money. That's a hustle. That's a hustle. And my last thing is, because I, I, I want us to keep on moving, but my last thing is, it's that important because if you put those images out on our screen to our future and instead of putting how awesome Scarface was and making Scarface, Scarface posters and Al Capone shirts, they'll stop being gangsters. Yeah. If that's what you, if you want to put that verb out there, or why, why they? That's why, because mainstream America, the people that are supposed to be leading us, lead us with this. This is what they see on their TV every day. Mm -hmm. But if they see a black man with a saxophone on their TV, or if they go to school and they see this black man, or it don't even matter the color. But if they, if you show them the variable, but especially for our kids, especially for our culture, if you show our young black kids somebody like Marquise Knox that's only 10 years older than them, what you think that might do for them? Mm -hmm. And can what I, can I, because um, I just want to like start off by like commending my mom and dad because I grew Amen. up in Cahokia. I grew up in Cahokia and there was, I promise you there was a, probably a fight every day and like, and it was like my, my dad, he would ask me, he'd be like, hey, how was your day at school? And I, and I would tell him, it, it's, it's pretty, it's okay. He's like, do you, would you, he was like, he asked me, he was like, do you want to go to Edwardsville? And I said, yes, I would love to go to Edwardsville. So we moved to Edwardsville and he showed me the nicer side, but he still took me back and he still showed me where my roots were. And I want to start off by saying thank you so much to Mr. Marquise Knox because Marquise showed me, he, showed, he opened my eyes to show me the real roots of what everything started off in. And if it wasn't for him and my father and, and Skeet Rogers and all of them, I probably wouldn't be singing the blues right now, you know? And I told somebody this yesterday, I was like, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be exposed to the blues and I wouldn't have as much caring about music as I do now. So, you know, I mean, like I listen to all, like I listen to all the rap and stuff now and it, it is so washed down, all you talk about is sex and drugs and all this stuff like that. And it's not, it's not worth it, honestly. It's really not worth losing your own life over it. Singing the blues is something that's real, it's true, you know? It's something that's, that's, you can actually be passionate about, that you can actually love, you know? Right. And it's, it's something like, it's something when you can just take that and you, and you can see people. And I'm like, I'm amazed every time I see Marquise up there and he's doing this thing and he's he feeling it, and I'm like, man, I, 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 I really want to get like that. I want to get like that, you know? So it's, it's honestly entertaining to watch. And, and just like, I know that that like shaped me as a person most definitely. And me being like 10 years younger than Marquise, it, it shows me that if Marquise can start off doing it at 13, I can do it now. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's my little bit on that one. So. And real quick, and that's why what you just said is so important. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so important for someone like Tika to be right there. Mm -hmm. I know. I know we doing that. So I, was, I, was, I was doing a mental thing like, man, here I go. I'm going to butcher this. But seriously, it's so, that's why it's so important for someone like her as well, for a young black woman, especially in music. Yep. In the blue, that's rare. Yeah. Especially in music. And I'm not going to take your take, because I, I know you got a lot to say about yeah. that. But that's why it's so important too, because the hurdles are even more, not only for a woman, not only for a woman in music, but for a black woman in music, it's ridiculous. So that's why it's so important to have these faces for the future. That's how we invest, by putting ourselves together and showing our future, this is what you can do. It ain't all about that. This is what you can do. But you, at the same time, you gotta put the fact behind it. You gotta put the fact and the truth behind it. Let them know what it's about. It's more than music. It's a heritage, it's your legacy, it's your roots. Put it behind it. That's what this man does. So that's what those Facebook posts do to me. That's the first thing I feel because that's a rare breed. Who would you, what, who would wrap yourself around someone like 27 years old talking like that? So imagine what that do for our future, for people that's, like I said, 10, he's 27. So someone that's 10 years younger than him is 17. 
Mm -hmm. Imagine what that does for a person. That's empowerment. Mm -hmm. That's what the blues is, is empowerment, especially for our people. So you have to invest in that. It has to be rich. That's why people are scared to invest in that mm -hmm. stuff because they don't, yeah, it, it empowers people. So like what, what, what happened was, it, I feel like it'll start another revolution, you know? And it won't be a negative, it'll be a positive one for most people because like it shows that there is more than just, just rap. Mm -hmm. There is more than just gospel or jazz. There is so much more that you can look into and it gets you hooked in blues. I don't understand it, but it gets you hooked for some bizarre reason. <laughs> you understand, that's why it you get it. It gets you hooked. <laughs> and like people, people, they ask me, they say, what you know about the blues? And I'm like, oh, I feel, I know a lot from the blues. <laughs> I don't have to, I don't have to, I, I can only sing, I could probably sing one song and, and you probably feel my entire it. struggle yeah, on it, right. honestly. And it, and it just shows that that's where most, that's where Marquise, I mean like Marquise, like he's 27 years old, he sounds like a, what, a 50 year old man singing the blues? <laughs> Genuinely, he, 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 yeah, <laughs> 10 years ago, and just listen to him now, I, I mean, like, I, I just started listening to him probably about a couple years ago, and it, and it, it's changed me completely, and I, and even, like, two years ago, I can see the, I can see the improvement and, and, and change, and you can see how much more mature this person has gotten from two years ago to now, you know, so, I mean, it, it just, it just shows that, again, like I was saying, if, if he can do it, I know I can, most definitely, because it just shows, it's something about being young, gifted, and black all at once. It, it threatens people. <laughs> it, it genuinely threatens people. And for me and for Tisa, we literally, they, they probably look at us and they, she, they probably think she finna sing Call on Tyrone. They probably think I'm finna <laughs> sing some, I'm probably finna sing some, some Motown. Some R. Kelly. Or some, or some R. Kelly some or something. R. Kelly, 12 and then they, they hear something, they hear something play. powerful coming out of our voices and they get, they get scared. They genuinely get scared. Like I, I'm, <laughs> and it's just like, it, it's something when, when, you, when you prove that person wrong, it's something, it's something a lot more powerful than just snapping on a person because they, they don't, because they don't know what you're, they don't know what you're capable of, you know. So I mean, it, it's something. And that's, I mean, you know, and as I mean, as a yeah. woman, like it's, I've dealt with so much adversity, dealing with men in the music industry. I, I'm ten years older than he is, you know, and I've been singing for a very long time, and I've walked out of many studios, I've left plenty of groups, I've stopped dealing with plenty of people, I've lost plenty of friends, but that is because, the, of the disrespect. In the music towards our mm -hmm. black women yes. and our yeah. culture, mm -hmm. we have to as black women we have to represent ourselves way more better, because this stuff that you see on TV now, these reality shows, I'm looking like this is this how black women act. This wait a minute, where are they from? Because I ain't never seen this in my life, mm -hmm. and and it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. We have to put better stuff on TV. This real housewives of whatever and basketball wives of whoever, who cares? What, teach us something better. Mm -hmm. You know, these women walking around with half not, nothing on. I'm sorry, my mom would be like, oh, excuse me, mm -hmm. where are you going with that on? No, I don't <laughs> think so. You might want to turn back around and change your clothes. But I, I was never like that because I knew better. But we have to teach our young women way better than that. Like, it was, I mean, the guys, the young black men, you know, that weren't taught the correct way to treat a lady, it was so disrespectful, so hurtful to me as a young black lady dealing with these young black men. And I'm like, did your mom not teach you? Don't, don't you love your mama? Why would you treat me like that? You know? And I had to find a different frequency. I had to change my way of thinking and uh, the way the universe comes to me. So by me changing my way of thinking, so much has happened for me. Uh, in the past couple of years, I've grown a lot, um, especially with the music. I've, I do R&B, I do blues, I do a lot. But my history is from blues. My grandpa played harmonica. I woke up every day to whatever music my uncle was gonna play in the basement. And if you play, if you heard that music at seven o'clock in the morning, you better get up. <laughs> because I'd be like, oh man, uncle, you could've gave me like 30 more minutes. My mom's like, uh-uh, get it on up. I'm like, oh, okay, fine, I'll get up. But I'm dancing my way down the steps. <laughs> and I'm brushing my teeth and I'm dancing, you know? And I'm singing in the bathroom, in the shower, you know? But we have to, we just have to, it's education. Like these, this young man right here, I didn't really know you, and I apologize. But um, I think we have to have more kids like him. We have to, what he was motivated by this young man over here, it should be way more of that. And for young ladies, it should be way more 
of us representing them to show them a better future. Mm -hmm. Again, education. Mm -hmm. Education is the key. We all have to educate ourselves. I don't care how old you are. We all need to educate ourselves on what we want our lives to be. We all have to change our way of thinking to present a different frequency in our lives. And I would say this, I, I see young, young ladies all the time, you know, and they, they like the fact that I sing and they're always like googly eyed and it's so cute. And I always tell them how beautiful they are, no matter what they look like, you know, and no matter where they come from. And I ask them how they're doing or what grade you in or, you know, mm -hmm. what you do in school today? Or do you like music? What kind of music do you like? I mean, just simple things like that will change a ch child's thought. And again, education. I tell my kids every day, mm -hmm. you guys are smart, you guys are beautiful, and I want you to be productive and uh, smart adults in this world. We need more of it. They are my future, so I have to teach them the best way I know how. And I was taught pretty well. I mean, I might not have done the right things all the time, <laughs> but I'm not no dummy. And I've, so I have removed myself from plenty of situations because of the behavior of not just black men, but men in general. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, all the sex and drugs and all that, it's, it's just a distraction. Mm -hmm. It's just a distraction that whoever you believe in or your devil or whoever is trying to distract you from what's good. It's trying to distract you from the frequency that you need to have to live a productive life. And it's all a distraction. We need to stray away from that. And again, education is so important to me. I didn't have the best education, but I am busting my behind to make sure my kids do. And I hope that we all are taking that measure for our children. Well, and for all of you, yeah. Thank you. Let's open it up to our audience.